Welcome, everyone, to another Voices with Reveki. I am here with Ethan Kobayashi, yeah, and I've spoken with Ethan before, and he's done uh, some amazing things, and he's doing some amazing things uh, with his partner, uh, and they have uh, a Tiamat, uh, Ecology of Practices, and uh, we released uh, a, a video of them uh, demonstrating some of that, and uh, so having Ethan back to talk more about that where it's going, what's happening, insights, um, so, you know, um, innovations and in practice, et cetera. So welcome, mm -hmm. Ethan. It's great to have you here. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me back, John. Yeah, it's really interesting to talk about this. I come with a little bit of weight because like, I'm thinking so much more particularly around like after the mechanical aspects are dealt with. So after the ecology of practice has integrated itself procedurally, then what happens? Mm -hmm. Like what happens internally to the person's experience and what's the process of integrating that? So that's something that I'm interested in exploring today. And I, I don't know, I hope that we can get somewhere that like we wouldn't be able to get to. Otherwise, I think that's the Dialogos. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, one, that's one of the defining features of Dialogos, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so what is coming alive for you right now as you uh, work out this ecology of practices? Yeah, something that's really arriving for me is this sense of, because you and Chris had spoken about the difference between signs and symbols. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and semiotics is actually quite an influential part of uh, performance theory. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the work of like Richard Schechner, very, very influenced by uh, Victor Turner, for example, as well. Yeah. So I was considering this as like, okay, uh, maybe, maybe this would be a good first proposal. That signs are referential and we know that, but I'm interested in looking at the nature of the relationship between the person and the sign. Mm. And so I articulate that relationship as largely orientational. So, you know, we go to, like in Singapore, we have a street, right? And there's a temple and a mosque and a church all side by side. And so the sign tells you what's what. But, there, but aside from an orientational relationship, uh, there's not much else there until it moves itself into the next stage, which I think at the moment I put down as an idol. So there's a relationship with an idol in a sense that it's an aspirational relationship. Mm. So it's coming into contact with the sign in a way that is not orientational, but instead has a direction to it, right? Mm. So the question of like, you know, oh, what would Jesus do? For example, um, there's, an, there's a kind of leaning in towards it. And, so you know, why, that was- Why yeah. would you use the term mm. idol there? The term idol is usually a negative term. Yeah, as opposed yeah. to like icon or something like that. So what 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 what's this? Why why use the term idol? Yeah, I think at the moment because it's uh, we are talked about in terms of. Well, I think it was mentioned that we are at the what is it? It's like a it's like an impasse with the idolatry. It's mm -hmm. stuck there. I think I want to change the term. I think it's not as exact, but I don't have something besides that for the moment. I'm right. trying to work out this problem. And well, maybe it's not that much of a problem, but I think that's just bridging for me into the symbolic relationship. Right. And so the symbolic nature of the relationship is existential, right? Okay. So that's bringing into a sense the participatory. And I'm working on this idea that ritual is the thing that bridges us between idolatry into a symbolic existential relationship with something. Ah, oh, I see. How's that landing with you? Okay, now I understand better. And you know, it's, yeah. So the, the 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 sense is the term idol is when this intermediate stage, in some sense, becomes a blockage to us. We get fixated on it, and we can't proceed into the properly symbolic. Is that mm. okay? In that yes. sense, in that yes. sense, I, I I don't have any objection to the use of the word idol. Many thinkers on idolatry would would use idol in that sense. That term in that way okay please continue yeah because this had been brought about by um something that i had read uh that jung wrote in the 1930s it was in an essay called the the holy man of india and he had articulated that the big problem with the west was that they had othered god mm. and this was in relation to uh, his visits into india of course we have to place jung in his time 
But I felt that that insight was really powerful. This sense that there is some kind of difference between saying, ah, to be in the presence of God mm. versus to be one with. It's hinting at a very different relationship. Mm. And if taken to the extreme, right, then I feel like, okay, that's where we kind of get to uh, megalomania, basically, right? Where the idea is that, oh, I am God, which is one end of the other of the extreme. But I think the other end of the extreme is this is an extension of this otherness to the point where there is no um, symbolic relationship that can be reclaimed. Mm -hmm. And that's for me very, very tricky. So, yeah. So this is where I'm kind of, mm, yeah. Oh, please so go ahead. You're trying to articulate the relationship. Uh, I think it sounds like to me, see if this lands. Mm. You're trying to articulate the relationship between the symbolic um, apprehension and whether or not one is participating or identifying or just representing mm. ultimate reality. Something so that the symbol is mm. it not only is symbol on to to join together. It's not only joining you and the thing um, mm. in some other important way, it's orienting you between um, identification and alienation. Is that, is that landing for you? Mm. Between alien, between identification and alienation. Yeah. Yes. So, I think there's some very important opponent processing happening down there. That's right. right. Whereas like God is not so far away from me that, you know, I'm stuck in an aspirational relationship and can only seek from here, yeah, right. but not so immersed to the point where it's like I now have dominion over everything. There's, there's something in between. And I wonder yeah. if this has to do with this sense of, um, what was this that um, I was reading Bushido by uh, Nito Beinazo, and it's a wonderful, wonderful book uh, on virtue, where he borrowed Matthew Arnold's words that religion is religion is morality touched by emotion. Mm. I thought that was a wonderful way of thinking about it. Why so? Yeah, that. So why so, and how, that, how does mm. that connect to the previous point? Um, mm. Because. I mean, there's all kinds of ways in which morality can be touched by emotion. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, self-righteous indignation um, <laughs> would be, is, and is that a religious phenomena? Um, uh, no, I don't right? think so. Mm. so. It feels... So, what, what, what felt, mm. so there's two things I'm trying to get connected. What felt right about mm. that definition? Because sort of in, in, in a semantic sense, it, it seems very inadequate as an account of religion. Yeah. Because so many counterexamples. And then what was it about that that you're trying to capture about, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I take it you're trying to get at something phenomenological and functional about mm. neither identification nor alienation. You're, to me, if you'd allow me, you're trying to unpack what participation feels like, um, but the, the word "feel" is really inadequate there. Um, yeah, it's how it's you're, you're trying to uh, how it shapes you and the world and fits you together with it. Things like that. Is that yeah. landing for you? It's it's along it's along that line. I think what I think first of all is like what participation how it affects us, what it's, what it's kind of phenomenological experience is. That's exactly right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then this, this thing of morality touched by emotion, I kind of liked the, the, the translation, but um, I, I was pulled in with this idea that one could be, if one could be so emotionally compelled to behave in a moral fashion, then that felt like something that was worth thinking about ah, because right. it was kind of like, like, like in meditations, Marcus Aurelius wrote that his, he was thanking his mom and that his mom could not conceive of an evil thought. Yes. It was not even available. Yep. Yeah. You know, and I was wondering, okay, so that feels, that felt right in a way. Okay. So let yeah. me reply to that because I mean, that's classically mm. 
in re, in the reasons for love by Frankfurt, that's what he calls the unthinkable. Um, mm. uh, uh, it, so uh, his mom could not uh, have an evil thought. It doesn't mean she couldn't entertain it in the sense of she couldn't run it through her mind or anything like yeah. that, but she can't bring herself to identify with the developmental pathway or the se sequence of action that would lead to that evil. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And, and, and so I, I use a similar example mm -hmm. of, you know, it's unthink my 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 old my eldest son lives with me, and mm. it would it's unthinkable to me that I would kick him out. Uh, he's mm. working hard on his career, right? There's no right. I can imagine it. I can I can run the proposition. Yeah, you know, I can chase him out and make all the inferences, right? I can imagine him leaving, but as as the phrase goes, I could never bring myself to do it. Uh, mm. Okay, and. I think that's properly understood as love, that situation, and that's the title of Frankfurt's book. And then I would put it to you that love is not a feeling or an emotion. Love is yes, an existential yes. stance. And I think we're talking about, therefore, a kind of um, orientation, like Stegmaier talks about, the way in which I locate and identify myself in the world and, uh, you know, mm. what, what, how I, how I am giving a, a sort of a, an initial framing of things that I take mm. to be sort of have a kind of priority for me. Um, I'm oriented towards my son in a way that I consistently prioritize. Mm. Well, I think what you're, what you're describing here with the prioritization feels like salience landscaping. Yes, it That's is. That's what's being foregrounded. Mm. But, you, but you can properly describe it as cultivating the character, character, character. Mm. Saying that right, right? Character, sometimes it, it sounds yeah. weird. <laughs> uh, you got it. Yeah. The character of your salience landscaping. Like the, mm. so you, you cultivate basically a, a, a set of constraints on your salience landscaping that prevents certain propositions or certain pictures from actually finding a, a place within your salience landscaping. Yes. So whenever I think about them, I have to disconnect myself from how I want to fit to the world. That's what, yeah. from my mind. And so I'm, that's what it is to prioritize uh, my son. Um, and that means there's certain propositions and there are certain pictures that mm. just I'm trying to use very broad categories here that I will not allow to shape my salience landscaping insofar as I'm trying to fit myself to the world for action. Did that make sense? Yes, yes. And this is this is uh giving me quite a lot of insight. And I really appreciate this sense of like having uh it feels like like guardrails, right? Yes. It's like guardrails on the yes. edge of a highway. And yes. so I would if I, I would propose that the cultivation of virtue is a kind of shaping of relevant realization in such yes. a way that certain things do not appear to be uh, uh, salient and action. Like they might be, they might can be entertained, but unthinkable to action. That's right. That's yeah. right. So there's and, guardrails. So I mm. think that's the, um, I think that's the the Greek virtue, sophroson. Sophroson is um, that kind of character formation of your salience landscaping such that as you said virtue you're constantly mm -hmm. virtue is that you are constantly inactively tempted by what by the good yes yes and I, okay so i want to add to this that i think that um by that building on that that the character or the or a sense of self and character is actually the line of consistency and invariance that exists across a multitude of different contexts. Yes. So things come in and test the character. Somebody does something and go, wow, man, that's a bit out of character yeah. for you, you know? And it's like, we're trying to, to get a sense of like not overfitting, like what is that consistent line in yes. between? I think that's kind of character to use a data sort of driven metaphor. But you see, I want to add a, sorry, go ahead. I, I, no, I, I mean, to, for I me, know. I think that's right. I think, um, I think th that th you're describing like the, the phenomenon of like a through line, uh, trying to find the through mm -hmm. line between all the different 
aspects of states and traits of being for me. I have certain states of mind and body, and I have certain traits, and I'm trying to figure out what's the through line. And mm. not only am I trying to figure it out, I'm trying to reorient the drawing of that through line so that it is, like I say, it's continually being tempted towards the good. Sofferson yeah. is not, that's why I don't like to translate, I don't translate it, calling it temperament or moderation doesn't capture what we're talking about here. Uh, McGee mm -hmm. argues in Philosophy as a Spiritual Practice that the best translation for Sofferson is something like mindfulness. Um, mm. And a more a better translation that's becoming more popular right now is sort of sound mindedness, um, which sound mindedness is, is again mm. this that you have sort of this or you have this way in which you orient to orientation um, mm -hmm. that uh, basically makes many things unthinkable to you in the way we've been talking about. And mm. then the issue is, what's the phenomenological experience of that? To get back to the original question, what does that yes. feel like? And what does that have to do with the issue of steering between, and I'm starting to see the steering mm. between the guide rails, because the guide rails help us steer between alienation and identification. So you've got sort of this mm. golden mean of orientation and virtues are sort of golden means. Um, and so I'm starting to get a sense of where you're going. Is this helping? Is this mm. getting clearer? Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think we're, we're starting to move in a really powerful direction because then uh, to add on to that question, uh, which is how do we do that? Because I'm more involved with the practical. Of course. And so there has to be some kind of, uh, I think I think it's a procedural stand. And so trying to bring, I'll try and bring symbol into this because I want to well, think I wanna, about- Before you do, symbols, can I remind you of one yes. other thing? Because you've already made a ah, proposal, yes. right? And ah. I want to bring that proposal back in because it's right on this point of the intersection mm. between the perspectival and the procedural and the participants, yes. which is the notion of ritual. I've been doing a lot of work on ritual uh, and, and ritual knowing. Because you made the proposal mm. that ritual is exactly the how to do this. Um, which is a very um, Confucian uh, pr uh, proposal in some ways. Uh, right. So I'm just asking, I'm requesting of you oh. that any answer or response you're giving, don't, mm. don't lose touch with that original proposal because I think there's something powerful in it. We got into this because yeah. we were trying to un unpack that in the first place. Yeah, so uh, I, was, I was trying to bring... Um, uh symbols in in relation to ritual because i think they're quite closely intertwined and this happened just out of a training session that occurred yesterday one of the one of the participants was really was really quite uh, uh powerfully articulating this sense of a kind of um metacognitive balance that was occurring so oh. i had issued to him a challenge he was like he was he was in a state for a few weeks of like, oh, you know, I'm not very goal oriented, or I don't really find like I want to do anything necessarily uh, in an improvisation or an exercise. And I was like, we're trying to figure out like, okay, how do you how do we orient you to being more goal oriented? And then we sort of talked it out and arrive at this thing of like maybe that's the issue. If we zoom out a little bit, maybe the maybe the thing that we're trying to challenge is not having goals. So let's try and boil that further down into uh, just something that takes your attention. So I issued him this challenge as I usually do with uh, each participant. It's like, let's see if during an improvisation, if something stands out to you and is super salient to you, can you vocally, like verbally declare that I'm fascinated by this and then involve yourself with it? You know, and it's like trying to just mark it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So what happened? Yeah. So... He later articulated that like it's really bizarre for him because he said like I feel a bit like detached, mm. but then the 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 experience is still very much occurring. Yes. But then I can do the thing that allows me to keep this event occurring. Right. You know, and that's kind of like what I'm what I'm trying to ah. to uh, 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 build for actors because it creates a kind of circular causality. Right. It's like this thing is fascinating. I'm going to interact with it. That puts some constraints on the amount of emergent chaos. It moves 
a little bit for that chaos informs what more constraints I put on it. And then it starts to get to this state of like this meta stability where things are still open for disruption uh, to disrupt, but there's a kind of like constant fascination with things in this particular participant's case. Right, right, right. So, <laughs> and I think this is really, it's really fascinating because they started to get into this thing where it was like, they were putting um, uh, rocks in, in a glass and he was pouring water into this glass. And one participant who had started this, he started putting the rocks in. We had talked about it later. As he's, he was trying to just like express what is happening in his mind of just like thoughts keep coming in and they keep overflowing. And then um, another participant was like talking about it in terms of, oh, it feels dangerous and I want to like take care of it and all that. Um, and then Tamaki was like, it feels like all of these things are like little like stones of energy and I want to drink the water that, it's, that is coming out of it. And I'm like, you guys have spontaneously made a symbol. Yes, 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 yes. You know, yeah. and that's what I mean. And they were, they were, they were articulating it in various, from various angles, this multi-perspectival. And then I asked the, the participant who had, started dropping this in i was like well what what came up for you what's it like to hear people describe it in this way and he said well it actually doesn't feel all that bad like yes, <laughs> it's yes. okay to have this yeah so that's why i'm tying ritual and symbol together in a sense of like procedural yes. procedural act of maintaining participation okay so that's very very powerful uh, let me let me try and respond in depth. Um, I like this proposal of the ritual emergence of a symbol, and this proposal of a symbol as a condensation of many different instances of perspectival connectedness, religio, mm -hmm. perspectival religio. We've got all these perspectives, and then the symbol is joining them together symbol on they're all converging mm -hmm. coming together and yet they are sensed as not being orthogonal or antagonistic to each other but somehow belonging together because that's what the, 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 the you just reported he, they all go together yeah. they all fit together in some way you want to say something go ahead yeah it's because that's the that's the cognitive that's the confirmation bias leaning in a communal way yeah it's yeah. like they bring their subjectivity into it and it gives the symbol more significance in yes. that sense yeah. right but they're also opened beyond their egocentric pers perspective because they're joining theirs to symbol on they're joining theirs to others now mm -mm -mm. and that's part of what's going on in a lot of the work by jennings and williams and boyd and shilbreck that what ritual knowing is doing it is doing something that's irreplaceable uh even by myth or or narrative mm. because what it's doing is you're actually engaging in this act of it's interesting because it's a loop first a ritual has two sides to it you're fitting yourself to some situation yeah right yeah. and the, right and and, and 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 you're sort of getting better at that but then as the symbol takes shape you also are, are, are right it's becoming something like a masterpiece you go from making it to then being responsible to it as it's emerging. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, and so the the, and the, the, uh, the the work by Shilbrek bringing those two currents together is important. And so the symbol is emerging out of that ritual loop and it's being done di like it's done, done multi-perspectively, dialogically. Mm. And then Is it that that symbol resists both alienation and identification because there is connectedness and at one moment, but it's not yours specifically. It's also others. And therefore you avoid the alienation and mm. the identification and you get a genuine sense of participation. Is that the argument that's being made here? I think that is that forms like a good part of the of the argument. I just want to tag on a little bit, which is that it is it is that because it is co-created, it's already fitted into the world. Yes, yes. 
Yes. Yes. So the coherence in a sense is in a sense is built in, and then the the significance is drawn out from it in the dialogical process. Yeah. Yeah. That's very good. Post. Yeah. 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 Post participation. Yeah. 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 Mm. There, there's a sense in which the focus, the focal point of the symbol also has a life of of its own right it, it has its mm -hmm. own through line and so whatever we're doing with it we, we it's not an what you're saying is it's not a it's not an empty canvas it's not a it's not a blank slate it also makes yeah. demands on us and in and and demands us to conform in certain ways right is that part of the yes authority? yes Oh yes, absolutely, and and there is there is an element of how live it is in a sense that okay, if in this example, if I used a plastic cup versus a actual glass cup, yeah. right, I would argue that the degree to which the participants have to conform to the danger that's presented by a glass cup would change radically. Yes, yeah, that's what I meant yeah. about the object yes. having a, a life of its own. It puts demands on us. Now, there's yeah. another dimension in the ritual literature that's really important, and Jennings brings this out, um, and this mm. is the issue of transfer. Uh, one of the ways of evaluating a good ritual is uh, the breadth and depth to which that practice in the ritual translates to areas, uh, other areas of your life. So it's only, mm -hmm. a, right, if it just stays internal to the situation, it's actually not a powerful symbol or, uh, or a particularly good ritual. But if it mm. if it transfers broadly and deeply, then it becomes a very powerful ritual, and the the objects that are being ritualized, I think that's a fair verb, uh, are become powerful symbols. Do you have any sense that the disclosures, the uh, and, and and the the ways of orienting that emerged? in that symbolic ritualization will transfer broadly and deeply. I think, okay, I think there's two, there's two sides of this. One is that the, the symbolic act in and of itself has different degrees of transference potential, depending on the amount of relevance it might have for the person. Of course, of course. And I think that's definitely, however, I think what does have transference actually is the situations that cause the symbol to emerge from the ritual in the first place. Ah, so the process as, a spo as opposed to the specific content is widely transferable. And so yes. you, that's interesting. You're taking almost like a meta ritualistic, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. like, but it's analogous to Geertz's idea of religion as a meta meaning system, right? The, so uh, the, 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 the one, I, I see what you're doing. The, you're sort of taking a step back and saying sort of all the dialogical and cognitive and metacognitive, you know, balancing mm. and dynamic interact that transfers, whereas the specific sort of propositions and content descriptions and things like that, that probably isn't mm. going to transfer to people, broadly into people's yeah. lives. Yeah. Okay. It's localized. It's localized in the same way that like video game mechanics are localized. Yeah, right? yeah. So I'm not going to use my my fingers in this scenario all the time. However, if I can if I can play a game in a particular way that challenges specific uh uh uh, uh how do I say this cognitive mechanics for me, I can also I can transfer that. Yeah. yeah. Even though it's not directly the procedural skill, but I can transfer the salience landscaping. Right, 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 yeah. right. So it's part of the function of the symbol to help to capture that meta optimal gripping, to use my language, uh -huh. of the ritual, yeah. right? So the, there's all this stuff going on and it might not, it might be highly localized, but what the symbol mm. helps do is take out- Exacting. Exacting those higher order, like meta orientation, meta optimal gripping features. Is that what you're proposing? Yes. Yes. I like that. I think that makes sense. Okay. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit because awesome. then I think that there is, there is something to be said for symbols which are object oriented, you know, but then I want to also think about symbols kind of loosely as anthropomorphized, anthropomorphized forms. So 
something that Tamacha and I have been discussing recently is like, how come we don't dream of people we don't completely know? Mm. And so we're like, okay, what does this mean? And it's almost as if like, uh, if we, uh, if I, if I dream. Wait, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I want to make sure I understand the claim. Is there, a, is there a claim that we don't dream of people we don't know particularly well? Because I, I've had those, I've had dreams like that. Uh, yeah. But, uh, so I just want to make clear what the claim is. Is that there is something that is akin to a feeling of knowing. Ah. And so this yeah. had come out because uh, she had this dream where uh, she had met a stranger, but she knew that the stranger was me ah. in the dream. Oh, now yeah. I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. It. So it's separating the perceptual imagery from this feeling of knowing. And this had come out of me looking at the work of Joel Pru, uh, who was who wrote uh, Foundations of Metacognition, was a co-author on that, and uh, the philosophy of metacognition. What I found really interesting is that metacognition is in and of itself, at least procedural metacognition, yes. pre-semantic. Very it's much. pre-propositional. It has to be. That's a good book. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I have to get back to it. I haven't finished it. Go ahead. Yeah, it's really, really, it's really wonderful because I think there's this sense that, okay, um, let's say, uh, I, okay, actors do this all the time, right? It's like, okay, I have, there's, there's you, okay, as uh, John Verveke, right? Okay. Now, if I dream of you, while I'm sleeping, whether or not it has actually happened, I have no comment, but the dream symbol, the symbolic version of you that exists is not the actual you, right? That's right. It's yeah. an avatarization of myself yeah. in some way. Yes. Okay? So what I found really interesting about what actors do um, is they pay attention to this form. So if we go and look at say, uh, you know, uh, ancient traditional writing, uh, on, on performance practice, things like uh, I've talked about it, uh, Zayami's treatises on No and Kabuki and the Natya Shastra, there's a lot of emphasis on form. Mm. It's very procedural. And so the idea here is that, okay, if I were to uh, pay attention highly procedurally to your gaze, your tone of voice, your physical body language, I inhabit your form yeah, yeah. And pay attention to my salience landscaping, right? Yeah. Then I get closer to thinking as John. Right, right, right. I get yeah. it. Okay. I on. don't know your propositions. I don't know your knowledge. Yeah. But it's possible to arrive at a, at a different way of, uh, of looking at the world in that sense. So... The idea being that we talked about internal family systems and this autopoetic pantheon before, and this is kind of where I'm trying to get to with it. It's like, if we internalize, say, okay, uh, internalize the procedure of dialectic into dialogos, the procedure of circling, the procedure of yes. Um, yes. animal forms, the procedure of push hands, then, okay, I can, I can speak to some avatarized symbolic version of somebody else, but it's actually myself in this way. I'm exacting that procedure, yeah, but yeah. then that is changing my perspectival yeah, knowing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if we do this for long enough, this entire machinery then becomes embodied. So we're talking about embodied multi-perspectival awareness, yeah, or multi-perspectival right. situational awareness. Yeah. And we hear this a lot, like... Um, I have a friend of mine who is uh, simultaneously an artist, but also a, a carpenter, right? And he'll say things like, you know, I'll, I'll go, like, bro, what do you think about this idea? He'd be like, man, you know, as a, the artist side of me is going like, yeah, that's really, really sick. It'll be cool to do. But the carpenter side of me is going, that's going to be tough. Yeah. And he has to negotiate those two. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So yeah. How, does this, how does this land with you? Uh, well, there's a lot going on there. Um, I, I was just fascinated. Um, so this idea, right, that you can catch somebody's orientation and not just their specific orientation, but something like their meta orientation and, and, and see and be as they are. Um, I think, I, I think that's, I think that's deeply right. And I incorporate that into my practice of Lexio Divina. Uh, mm. so 
So I read the text, that's the, the Lexio, and then the meditate is, can I imaginally in, in, enact any of the images or metaphors or perspectives being taken in the text? Mm. The oratio is, I, you know, I enter into a dialogical relationship with the perspective and the presencing of the text. Yeah. But in order to do what you just said, I do that so that I can then open my eyes and see and be in the world from the perspective that generated the text. So I know I know exactly what you're talking about. And then that seems to me to be if the ability to take multiple perspectives is a core feature of wisdom, and that was one of the strongest proposals mm. that came out of the wisdom consensus paper, then practicing this, this I don't know, virtuosity, it's not quite a virtue, but it's a virtuosity, practicing yeah, yeah. this virtuosity, I think is a powerful way to make ourselves wiser by making, by having us embody our, embody a, 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 a viable and mm. powerful multi-perspectival ability. That's what I'm getting from this. And that, mm. and then what I'm trying now to piece together is what we've said before. And that gem, right. That that's coming out is you, you see, let, let me try this. We've got the ritual, yeah. right. And then we're yeah, getting yeah, yeah. The, the symbol that allows us to exact for transfer. But what we're exacting is not that specific perspectival orientation. We're exacting mm -hmm. a more meta perspectival ability. In fact, this ability to right, take multiple perspectives is part of what's, yes, right. And then we're learning to embody that. And that's actually a real practice for the cultivation of wisdom. If the ability to take multiple perspectives, uh, to have that meta perspectival flexibility is crucial mm. to wisdom, which, which I argue based on the consensus paper is in fact a central feature. That's how I'm stringing this all together from what you're saying. Yes. I think that's, I think you're absolutely right here. This sense of it's, it's kind of like putting, putting different perspectives together in a string Yes. Until it's so fluent that it's not saying, it's not trying to ally oneself to one particular perspective. Is that I can, I can practice the skill of moving between perspectives yes. and drafting this to the point where it's completely embodied. And That's I it. would add to this and say that if it's grounded in communitas. Yes. Yes. That, yes. Yes. Right. Yes. It's that sense of like, you know, no, like, uh, considering the idea that no sage is a is a lone wolf is this sense of like oh many sages and we were talking about this like you know perhaps what the what the ancient greeks were doing in in the act of philosophy is exactly this like i want to try and think like my peers so that they are almost uh, there is a version of this peer in me that i can dialogue with exactly and then bring to the table that's what Antisthenes said he had learned from Socrates. He learned how to converse with himself. He learned how to enter into dialogos with himself. Um, I would, mm. That's what I, how I would put it. I think that's exactly right. There's a lot here that's very, very rich uh, in what you're saying. Um, I, I, I'm trying to, because I, I, I've been recording uh, after Socrates, and this is part of the argument I've been making about mm. what dialectic into dialogos does and how it works for us. What I like mm. what you're bringing in here which I also was trying to do in the series is connecting ritual and symbol formation to this internalizing a symphony of sages as a way of cultivating wisdom. Um, but like mm. you said, it becomes deeply embodied. It has to become sophrosan. It has to become, as we say, as we say, second nature uh, to you. Um, the second nature of your second self um mm. yeah i i i just i just want to pause and just it's it's really it's a golden opportunity to talk to you because you and your partner and your community you're doing so much experimental participation 
trying to get at the machinery of symbol and ritual and religio and sophrason and the you know and the, and the multi perspectival flow that makes one wiser i just, yeah getting to a place where you have these perspectives and you can genuinely flow between them almost get into a flow state uh through mm -hmm. them um that that's I, I imagine the people in your group feel like they're participating in something incredibly special and important I don't know. I have to ask them. I'll send you their reflections. <laughs> we actually have an ex-student of yours in this group. Yeah, you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you should yeah. ask them then. Uh, because yeah. to my mind, I mean, this part that you're working out, this inactive ritual symbolic form mm -hmm. of dialectic into dialogos, this has got to become part of any understanding of dialectic into dialogos. So in addition to the propositional conversational mm. and gestural that Guy and Chris, Guy Senstock and Christopher Master Pietro and I are emphasizing this, right? Th this ritual dramatic uh, version that you're talking about, th they're both needed. I'm struggling because, but do you see what I'm yes. saying, uh, right? I, I, yeah. Any ecology of practices should have both the conversational version, if you allow me to put it that way, and mm -hmm. and, and the improvisational enacted version. I, I don't know quite what the right adjectives are to use for no, you. No, I think, no, I think enacted, enacted is absolutely correct. I think, but something that we have run into recently is that, uh, and this is not to discredit the great work that you've done on the meditation practices, but it's like they were really difficult yeah. um, for for people to get into because of like one, I think the amount of propositional content, um, but two is that not meditation is not necessarily for everybody at every single yes. no, no, stage I, of their I, life. I know this. Yeah. I often, I often, I, there's a significant minority, but mm. reliable in any class I teach where I tell them. Stop the seated meditation. Take up Tai Chi Chuan. You need to be mm. doing a moving mindfulness practice. Yes, I totally, I totally. Yes, do. yes. My, and so my my, 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 my sort of anecdotal evidence from two decades of teaching it, 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 it mm. is very consistent with what you're proposing. Yes. Yeah. No, we had one. We had we had one um, scenario where it was actually just after running through the core four, and we were about to get into meta contemplation, and like this feedback was coming through from the participants. It's like, wow, I'm getting it. It's hard to grab this, like the propositionally foundational stuff to do the meditation. And I don't want them to feel like, oh crap, there's a, there's a gate, there's a gate there yeah. that I can't cross. So uh, what we did was we actually turned the meta contemplation into a dialogical practice. Yeah. I, I've been doing yeah. similar things. I mean, where, um, I've turned the meta into more of a reciprocal opening and dialogical practice between you and the world, um, done imaginally. So yes, I've, I've let I've been led Ooh. in this direction. Yes, Yo, I, okay, okay. I, I, so I, and, and in some versions, I actually encourage people to do an active gesturing, to do the reciprocal opening gesture as they are uh, imaginally trying to reciprocally open with the world. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. Because what we what we've done is we've made it like completely one to one. So ah. it's that it's like okay. So in this exercise, I mean, I don't mind sharing this. It's that like we be in a we be present with each other, right? And so I have three options available to me at any time. And if you're watching this, you can try this out as well um, with a partner, right? You have three options available to you at any point. Who am I to you, and who are you to me? Yeah. Right. Do I want anything from you or am I with you? Or rather, do you do I want anything? Do you want anything from me? Right. Or are you with me? Yes. Right. And how does that feel? So we would go back and forth and I might answer the question, but then I have to then end that with another one of these three options. I see. And so what ends up happening is like. It is trying to turn this partner into into an internal symbol that yes. can ask these questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, who are you to the world? Who are you? 
And surprisingly, it was easier for them to do it afterwards. Of course. The, the meta contemplation. That makes, that makes yeah. perfect sense to me. That's very good. I like that. Yeah. It's very good. So I've been trying to do this with the, with the rest of the meditations um, as well, trying to get an enacted um, dialogical part of it in. And this comes to the, or what I, what I feel is, a, is one of the bigger roadblocks, which is that um, my best friend had said it, that we are at, we are in the age of the facilitator. Mm. And coming out of the age of the instructor. So the age of the instructor being to instantiate a structure yeah. and then facilitator, which is to, you know, make things easy. But I think it's less about a comparative judgment between easy and difficult and more of how to guide towards ease. Yeah, no, no. It, yeah you're trying to be conducive. I, I think that's, that, that's, yeah, I think that's right. I like this idea though about try, pairing individual versions of the meditative or contemplative practices with dialogical twins, if I can put it mm -hmm. that way. And then the, they mutually inform each other. That's really good. I like that a lot. Uh, sort of doing that a bit, but that's an example of what I mean by layering practices together. Um, yeah. as, part of a, as design principle in ecology of practice. That's very, very cool. That's very, very cool. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. Because <laughs> I'm I'm working on this idea here. It's just like I think the it's hard to to um depart necessarily from uh from a tradition. I, I think that's not easy to do, but I think that innovation is going to be useful and innovation in the form in a sense that is context specific. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I started to con to contemplate facilitation as an agapic practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In and of itself. You're trying to conduce people yeah. into sophrosan. And then the sophrosan yeah. will conduce them into other virtue. And then the virtues will conduce them towards wisdom. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Because the it, I think you you have brought it up also uh in one of your in one of your your talks. I can't remember if it was the rationality and ritual one, but that like if you were to speak to your son, you're, he's internalizing you. Right? Yes, 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 yes. And so it, in the act of facilitation, it's kind of, it, it's multi-layered in the sense that first, as a facilitator, I have to really deeply participate in the person and go, yeah. where are they finding difficulty? What's going to be difficult? What have they done before? And can I hold, like, can I hold them at that standard because they know, that's where I know that they've already done their best, right? Mm -hmm. And so, that's kind of like the 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 standard at which I will I will put my foot down. Right. But then the other part of that is also saying, mm, I will take them as that is, but at the same time, how am I going to get them to to stay there? What kind of voice? How am I get them to to stay and surpass and transcend this level? Yeah, but. What kind of voice do I want to be as a facilitator? Right. If I'm going to be internalized, <laughs> what am I going to be? And that makes me think real like hard about. Yeah. Mm, I've been thinking a lot word. about that. Um, the indwelling internalizing loop. You have to indwell your student uh, uh, so that they can internalize you and you have to internalize them as well. So, right. You're trying to, you indwell them so you can internalize them so that they can indwell mm. you so they can internalize you. Um, and that sort of that matching. And what does that feel like? And what are the skills around it uh, that help make it work? And then what is the proper orientation that make it right, right? Make, make it work well and make it work morally in a morally um, mm. praiseworthy manner? Um, yeah, I agree. I think th those, that, th those questions... But those questions are, 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 they overlap with the very questions of how to practice dialectic into dialogos, because that's exactly, we're trying yeah, to yeah. be mutual facilitators to each other. We're trying to, the group is trying to be the Socrates to each member of the group. Um, and so that, that's, that, that question is, it, 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 I keep coming back to it and mm. I, get, I get more clarity on it, but um, I need these discussions that I, like I'm having with you, Ethan, because I need all this 
all this convergence from many multiple perspectives to unfold the depth mm -hmm. of what's happening here. We're, we're almost out of time and I'd like to offer people the, yes. the last word. So <laughs> here's your opportunity for the last word. Yeah. First of all, uh, I wanna, so... before you do, I want to really thank you. This was really excellent. I, your experimental phenomenology where you're also reflecting on the underlying functionality is exactly the kind of improvisational investigation that people should be engaging with as they they right uh, as, as they are curating an ecology of practices but you're also not doing it autodidactically you're looking at important no. you know philosophical and cognitive scientific theory and, and like the way you're putting that all together is amazing so i just want to note that Thank you very, very much. Um, yeah, I am. I can be found uh, at 5 to midnightorg I'll drop the link at the bottom. Uh, we have a set of new packages and kind of like training opportunities. I'm more than happy to speak with people and arrange some stuff out. If you're a student, it doesn't matter. Like, just come, let's have a conversation um, and see what works. Um, I'm also started a podcast called Minutes to Midnight, uh, and that's available on the 5 to Midnight channel uh the first <laughs> the first episode is kind of like a uh i think it's a version i called it the cave because it's a version of like plato's uh, uh myth but oh. we'll be exploring how more in depth about how tmi actually you know counters hopefully counters uh parasitic processing and the perennial problems right. um, but yeah, uh, if you'd like to check me and Tamaki out, we'll also do some Dear Logos episodes between the two of us and put them up on uh, the YouTube channel so you get a chance to watch that as well. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks so much, John. Thank you so yeah. much, Ethan.